Hi everyone, and welcome back to the channel. If you're new to the channel, I'm James, and you're watching Wonderful World. And it's been a while since I've done a reptile room tour, and things have changed a bit in here since the last one. Over the last year, just about every animal in this room has had an enclosure upgrade or makeover, and it really makes me happy to see them enjoying the extra space and enrichment. Every enclosure you'll see in this room is completely bioactive, and I've been keeping all of my amphibians and reptiles that way for quite a while now, and seeing how much both the animals and I have benefited from that, at this point, I can't imagine keeping them any other way. So I'll start with this wall first. And one thing that really stands out in the room are these two big enclosures for my corn snake pumpkin and my ball python jerry. They both have absolutely been flourishing with the extra space and more opportunities to climb and explore. Building these enclosures was a lot of work, and I have a previous video on how I did that, so I'll put up a link to that video in the corner if you'd like to see that. For myself, one thing I really love about these two enclosures is that I had one fourth inch glass cut for the sliding doors. And the thicker glass feels so solid and slides so smoothly. Pumpkin is a four-year-old male amelanistic corn snake. And while that's a very common corn snake, he is very special to me. I've spent a lot of time working with him, and I think he's a perfect example of how tame and friendly a snake can be, and how they can make such wonderful pets. And I can easily say the same thing about Jerry. If you follow the channel, then you've definitely seen Jerry because he's about my favorite co-host. Jerry is a male pastel inchy ball python, and he'll soon be turning three years old. And while he might have some more growing to do, I think he's getting close to his full grown size. And next to Jerry and Pumpkin is this 50-gallon paludarium for my American bullfrog, Lucille. This may seem like a big enclosure for one frog, but Lucille is so active, he uses every bit of this space. He loves to be in the water, but he also likes to chill out hidden behind the ferns on either side of the paludarium but I would love to upgrade Lucille to a 75 gallon one of these days. Lucille isn't tame or friendly at all. Actually, he's probably one of the wildest animals in this room. Bullfrogs have lots of sharp teeth and I have no doubt that if I gave him the opportunity, he'd give me stitches. But he's absolutely one of the most beautiful animals in this room and just amazing to watch. I recently caught some footage of Lucille shedding his skin and it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever observed in this room. You'll just have to watch that video to see what I mean. So I'll put up a link to that one too. And next to Lucille is this chest of drawers that I converted into two enclosures for both of my leopard geckos, Laverne and Puff. 
I've had Laverne for quite a while now, and she's gotten so big. She's also one of the friendliest and most tame reptiles that I've ever had. But even more than that, she definitely knows me as her person. Not too long ago, my daughter-in-law was here visiting and we took Laverne out. And Laverne crawled right into my hands when I opened the door to her enclosure. And we sat down and I had Lily lay her hands out flat. And while I thought Laverne would be happy to crawl from my hands into hers, Laverne didn't want to leave my hands and seemed like that was where she felt safe. Now Puff is a completely different story. Puff came from a PetSmart store and when they discovered that he was mostly blind and they couldn't sell him, they asked me to take care of him. Now, I wouldn't call this a rescue as much as an adoption because they cared about Puff and were doing the best they could for him. But Puff hasn't been easy. He can't see well enough to find his food, so he relies on me to hand feed him, and that's fine. I enjoy that as special time that I spend with Puff. But having the vision problems that he does, Puff is so skittish and cautious and easily frightened. When Puff gets spooked, he just bolts in any direction without really knowing where he's going. And as much as I've been patiently trying everything I can to get him socialized and more comfortable with me, that's turning out to be quite a challenge. But I love him just the same, and just look how cute that little face is. Sitting on top of this leopard gecko cabinet is this 12 by 12 Exoterra nano terrarium, which for a while was a home for a colony of land snails. And I really enjoyed those snails, but I made a decision to return them to the forest where I got them. They just made too much of a slimy mess on the glass, and they ate any plants that I put in the vivarium. So instead, I rehoused my golden blue leg baboon tarantula into this terrarium. Her name is Jewel, and she's starting to grow into one of the most beautiful creatures I've ever known. So turning the corner, we come to my giant day gecko, Carl. And of all the enclosure upgrades that I've made, this is the one that I think has been the most appreciated. I moved Carl into this 36 inch tall Zoomed skyscraper terrarium and put in these big sycamore limbs for him to climb on. Carl has so much more room in here and since he's been in here, he's been much less skittish or at least as less skittish as a day gecko can be. I've also tried something that I've never used before, and this is a mercury vapor UVB lamp that provides heat and UVB with one lamp. And Carl loves basking under this lamp. My only concern is that it seems to have burned the two big deck Bombachia plants that I put in here. My hope is that this will be a temporary shock and the plants will come back okay with new growth. I'll do an update on that sometime in the future. One thing I can say about Carl is that although he's a challenge to care for, he's probably one of the most stunningly beautiful animals in the room. And next to Carl is the vivarium for my three anoli lizards, Snap, Crackle, and Pop. They haven't gotten a size upgrade yet, but I did replant and remodel their vivarium. One of these days, I'm going to give them the same skyscraper terrarium that Carl got, but they're doing fine in here for now. 
I planted a few orchids in this one, and while I've not had much luck with the orchids in the Bavarians, I'm really hoping I can get these to bloom in here. One of these anoles has a bright orange dewlap that is the same color as the flowers of this particular orchid. And if I can see him puffing out his dewlap against a background of orange orchids, I mean, seriously, how beautiful would that be? I'm hoping it's something that I can get on video one of these days. And moving on over is my group of American green tree frogs. And this is where I have some bad news because one of these frogs recently passed away. His name was Bobby and he was actually my favorite of the group because he was the only male. And Jeannie and I have both loved hearing his hilarious calls. Bobby developed a prolapse and we just couldn't get it under control and he will be definitely missed. But the remaining three females are fat and happy, and this is one of my favorite Bavarians. I love the Hoya and the watermelon begonias, and the leaves of these Hoya vines couldn't be more perfect for these small tree frogs. Above the tree frogs is a shelf that has kind of a collection of tarantula molds and my Chaco Golden Knee tarantula. His name is Muffin. Don't ask me how I came up with that because I have no idea. This tarantula is only seven months old, but he's growing so fast. He's one tarantula that spends a lot of time outside of his burrow, and that's been really fun. He's also a species that can grow to have an 8-inch diagonal leg span, and I can't wait to see him reach his full potential. And by the time he's ready for another rehouse, I have something very special and beautiful planned for him. And in the corner here is the vivarium for my tomato frog, Scarlet. Scarlet's been a fan favorite on the channel, and he's one of my favorites too. I guess the way that I'd describe Scarlet is that he's beautiful and goofy at the same time. Scarlet picks a spot and pretty much sits there in one place for about a week or so and then moves to a different spot and does the same thing, and so on and so on. So you'd think that a tomato frog would be a boring frog to keep, but he's not at all. I've had Scarlet for quite a while now, and there's just something about him. He's so lovable that I never get tired of watching him or caring for him. Turning the corner again, we come to this 40 gallon tank that's the enclosure for my California king snake, Rex. Rex is still a young snake. He's just a little bit over two years old. And he's grown quite a bit, but he still has more growing to do. But more than that, Rex is starting to show some signs of maturing. Baby snakes are usually skittish and like to hide, and that's definitely been Rex. But as a snake becomes an adult, they usually become much more confident, and along with that, they'll become much less shy or defensive. And in recent months, I've started seeing that change in Rex. I've seen him out exploring his enclosure more often, and he's been a lot more calm about coming out of his enclosure and being handled. Although he still musks on me every time I pick him up, he's a really easygoing snake once I have him in my hands. Rex is another one that I'm really looking forward to seeing his full potential.
And speaking of potential, next to Rex is my two-year-old male BCI boa constrictor, Ray. He lives in this four foot by two foot by four foot enclosure that I also put a lot of work into building. Ray is an absolute sweetheart of a snake. He's never hissed or acted defensive towards me in any way. And he's so fun to handle and interact with. Ray is still just a juvenile snake and has a lot of growing to do. But just like Rex, I've been able to see certain signs of maturity in him too. Boa constrictors are semi-arboreal and especially as babies will spend a majority of their time hanging out on any limbs and branches you give them. And that would describe the first year and a half of Ray's life exactly. Then as they grow and their bodies start becoming heavier, they'll start spending more time on the ground. And over the last six months, this is what Ray has done. He still likes to bask high up under his heat lamp and his favorite place to sleep is the highest spot on the cool side. It was originally intended to be a planter, but Ray trampled the plants to death. So I filled it with sphagnum moss and Ray loves this spot. You can even see the indentation that he's formed as he slept in the spot. But nowadays he comes down to the ground and spend most of his days on the ground in his warm side hide. So I talked about potential and obviously Ray enjoys using every bit of this enclosure. If he outgrows this enclosure in the future, I'm prepared to give him something even bigger. So I don't understand why so many people keep their boa constrictors in short enclosures. I love the snakes so much and I want to give them the best that I possibly can. So moving on, we'll take a look at everything along this wall. And I'll start with my pair of Eastern Garter Snakes, Daryl and Carol. Both of these snakes are completely full grown at this point. And one thing that's fascinating about them is the sexual dimorphism. More simply said, the females are significantly larger than the males. And Carol is getting to be a big girl. I've said several times before on the channel that I've never been bitten by a snake. Well, a few weeks ago that changed and my snake bite initiation came from Carol. I love that garter snakes thrive in pairs and groups, but it makes it a challenge at feeding time. Garter snakes have very strong feeding responses, and once that switch is flipped, look out. I was concentrating on Daryl and trying to get him to take his mouse, and for a moment, I wasn't paying attention to Carol, and she grabbed onto my finger that was holding the feeding tongs. Although garter snakes are rear fanged venomous, she didn't hold on and she didn't chew on me. And it did hurt a little bit, but it wasn't awful. And it wasn't her fault. She was in feeding mode and my hand was in her enclosure, so I kind of asked for it. I've spent more time lately handling and socializing these two snakes, and they're both very calm and friendly as long as there's not food involved. And I'll slide over to the floor on the other side of this closet. Last spring, Carol gave birth to 15 babies. Well, it ended up being 14 after Daryl ate one of them, but we'll not talk about that. I rehomed all of them but two, and this is Raven and Sparrow. I kept these two not because they were the pick of the litter, but because they have some severe kinks in their bodies. 
it's sad and it takes a little getting used to to watch how much they have to struggle to move around. But they're actually doing all right considering the challenges that they've had to face. They're growing and at six months of age, they're still shedding about once a week or two. It's inevitable that there will be more litters in the future, so I'm hoping that those will all be healthy babies when that time comes. So above Raven and Sparrow is my crested gecko Morgan. I recently replanted and remodeled Morgan's Babarium, and I think it looks beautiful. But more importantly, I think a better design and better choices of plants have made Morgan much happier. He's a really skittish gecko. He won't tolerate being handled at all, and he gets started very easily. And that's just how Morgan is. But just like Carl, he's been a lot more calm since getting new and better plants. I can actually go in and trim plants or clean the vivarium without Morgan freaking out, which makes me happy too. And on the top left of this wall are my two Dendrobates tinctorious powder blue dart frogs. This used to be a group of four, but sadly over this last year, two of them have died. I really don't know what happened with these two frogs because I have their husbandry dialed in pretty well. But at this point, I think the largest female of the group bullied those two frogs. Tinctorious are known for that, and especially the females. In hindsight, I should have separated them, but I just didn't see it. But the two remaining females seem to be getting along fine, so I'm not too worried about them. And right here is the newest vivarium in the room. You may have seen the recent video on this upgrade for Sunshine, my Dindle Brady's Leucomelus Darfrog. I absolutely love the way this vivarium turned out. I love the way it's planted, and I love the way this floating shelf turned out. Sunshine is a pretty adept climber, and she uses every inch of this vivarium. She loves the broad leaves of this alocasia and makes a lot of use of the bromeliads, as dark frogs do. And Sunshine isn't the only one that will be living in this vivarium. Very soon, she'll be joined by a pair of morning geckos, but that's going to be the subject of a future video. And last but not least is this vivarium for my two tiger-legged monkey tree frogs, basil and parsley. This vivarium might look different from the last time I showed it. It got a little bit overgrown, so I changed up a few plants and did some sprucing up in here as well. These two frogs are so beautiful and so unusual. I hear their little chirping and popping calls very often, usually late at night or very early in the morning. But they're so reclusive that I only see them very infrequently. Really, if I want to see them at all, I have to slip in here at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I sleep on a king-size sleep number bed, and I like my sleep. 
So that doesn't happen very often. But in a way, I like that about these frogs because when I do actually see them, it's something special. I hope you enjoyed this reptile room tour, and this room is such a special place to me. It's a sanctuary for both myself and all of the animals that live here, so it's really an honor to be able to share it with you. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.